Welcome to the Toronto Reference Library, and thank you all for coming out on such a miserable night. It's great to have you here tonight. My name is Monica Croydon, and I'm one of the librarians here at the Toronto Reference Library. I work up on the fourth floor in the Languages and Literature Department. Welcome to the Spring A-List, our celebration of writers from across Canada. Before I begin my introductions, I would like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts for their support of the A-List series. Tonight, we're very pleased to welcome Lisa Moore. Lisa Moore grew up on the outskirts of St. John's and still makes her home there. Her writing is strongly influenced by her life in Newfoundland. She originally intended to be a visual artist and attended the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. She continues to paint today, but she shifted her primary focus to writing after joining the writing group Burning Rock at Memorial University. Moore's first two books, Degrees of Nakedness, published in 1995, and Open, published in 2002, are both short story collections. Open was shortlisted for the Giller Prize, as was Alligator, Moore's first novel, published in 2005. In 2006, Alligator won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for the Caribbean and Canada region. February, her second novel, published in 2009, and Open, were both shortlisted for the Winter Set Award. February was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, as well as the winner of the 2013 CBC Canada Reads. Lisa's most recent novel, Caught, published in 2013, was shortlisted for the Giller Prize and the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Award. Set in the 1970s, it tells the compelling story of Newfoundlander David Slaney, a recently escaped convict who decides to make a second attempt at smuggling marijuana from Colombia to Canada. Lisa was the 2013 recipient of the Writers' Trust Engel Finley Mid-Career Award for Fiction. This award is given to a mid-career writer in recognition of a remarkable body of work and in anticipation of future contributions to Canadian literature. I'm sure that we all share that anticipation. Please welcome Lisa Moore. Thank you, Monica. And I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Toronto Public Library for having me and also thank all of you for being here. Um, I'd also like to thank Jillian and Barbara and Janie who are here from Anansi tonight and um, got me to the church on time. So <clears throat> as Monica said, uh, well, first let me check, is, is this, can you all hear me? It's not too loud or, okay, great. So as Monica said, pot, pot, caught, uh, caught, <laughs> and actually that's how the book got named because, uh, you know, I, my publisher had phoned me and I was on a cell phone and I was around the bay in the country and uh, she, I, was, I couldn't hear her very well and she, she was sort of yelling and saying, what are we going to call this book? And I said... I don't know, pot? And she said, caught? <laughs> and so that's how, that's how it got its title, uh, more or less. So it's a story of two young men in Newfoundland. They're 24 years old. They decide to smuggle the largest amount of pot ever smuggled into Canada in 1974. And they get caught. And then, four years later, they decide to do it again. Now, four years later, one of them, David Slaney, has gone to prison, and he's been in prison for four years. And the other character, his friend, his childhood friend, um, uh, broke out, uh, jumped bail, headed across the country to Vancouver, and lived underground and went to university. So when I was growing up in Newfoundland, when I was sort of coming of age, you know, around 14 or 15, the sto the, this novel is based on a bunch of true stories that happened in Newfoundland. So probably four or five different cases of Newfoundlanders trying to import uh, pot. And when I was growing up, uh, when I'd hear these stories, you know, probably... Um, 10 years after, after they'd all happened, you know, I'd go to a bar and people would be talking about these stories and, and telling the tales of these stories. Um, 
people spoke about it with a kind of awe, like they, they were impressed with the just the audacious energy these young guys had. And Newfoundland was a place where, you know, we, we survived on most, most people fished. And f fishing um, in Newfoundland was not a very profitable enterprise for the fishermen. Because for, for many years, um, the fishermen were in debt to the merchants. So each community had a merchant, and the merchant would give the fishermen their equipment for the year's fishing. And that equipment was loaned to them, was on loan. And then when they brought the fish in for the season, they, it was the merchants who determined what the fish was worth. And it turned out that the fishermen never got enough money to pay for the equipment. So they were always in debt to the merchant. They were always in hawk to the merchant. And at the end of the 70s, that was a time when Newfoundlanders were really beginning to see that the cod stocks were depleted. And so when these young guys decided to import this pot, it was like they had decided to cut out the middleman. So they were going to do this thing. They were going to go on the ocean in, in sailboats and bring back this fabulous amount of money, basically. You know, unheard of amounts of money. And, and they would become rich. So I think that's part of the reason people responded to the story with such, you know, recognizing in these young men the bravado that was required to, to pull this off. And of course, the 70s were also a time when drug taking, drug smuggling, the nature of drug smuggling really changed. So it was, it was at a moment when just before the sort of rise of death squads uh, uh, south of the border, it was just before pot, and at that time pot was a very you know gentle kind of drug. I'm told, um, and and it was thought of as as a you know an experiment in in altering states of mind. And it was thought of as a, as a way to, you know, learn new things about how we can think and what we can think. Um, but just after the 70s, a pot was sort of uh, given over to harder, much harder drugs, the kind of drugs that we see ruining people's lives, you know, um, coke and heroin, and, that, and that's when the, the violence that we see below, south of the border really took root. And so there was a kind of loss of innocence when, in terms of drug smuggling at the end of the 70s. I also think it was a time when we began to, you know, culture changed dramatically, and we began to see the dismantling of the safety, the, the you know, social safety net. So times got meaner all of a sudden. And it was a time when um, there was a uh, innovation in technology. And this book is really a lot about that innovation. Because as those boys were heading across the country, uh, the RCMP had just developed a new technology, which was a satellite technology. And they could be traced the whole way that they, you know, as, as they went across the country, made it to Vancouver, and headed down uh, the Pacific coast, they were being watched. And it was a new technology, and it was a technology they couldn't have dreamt of. They had no way of knowing how doomed their, their uh, journey might be. And that really interested me too when I went to write this novel because I, I felt like it was the moment that we're all living the, the blossoming of that moment because, you know, everything we do is under surveillance now. Every time we use a credit card, every purchase we make is tracked and traced. When our children go to school, you know, they're walking down corridors with uh, surveillance cameras taping them. If, you go in, if they go into a convenience store, they're being taped. Um, and we're being watched in many different ways. So it was the advent of that moment when, uh, you know, when that kind of massive surveillance erupted. So I'd just like to start and read you a section of 
David Slaney breaking out of prison. This is, he's been in prison for four years. He's been in touch with his friend Hearn. This new operation is set up and he is on his way. Everything will happen from here, he thought. This time, they would do it right. He could feel luck like an animal presence, feral and watchful. He would have to coax it out into the open, grab it by the throat. Slaney had broken out of prison and beaten his way through the forest. He'd stumbled into a patch of lupins. The searchlight in the prison yard must have seeped into his skin, a radioactive buzz that left him with something extra. He wasn't himself. He was himself and something added. Or the light had bleached away everything he was except the need to not be attacked by police dogs. There was the scent of lupins as he bashed through, the wet stalks grabbing at his shins, cold raindrops scattering from the leaves. Then he was up on the shoulder of the road. He batted his hands around his head, girly swings at the swarms of mosquitoes. The prayers he said between filthy gusts of language were polite, and he honed his petition down to a single word, and the word was, please. His prayers were meant to stave off the dread he felt and a shame that had nothing to do with the crime he'd committed or the fact that he was standing on the side of the road under a moon covered in mud at the mercy of an ex-convict with a transport truck because there's been a ride arranged for him. It was a rootless and fickle shame. It might have been someone else's shame, a storm touching down, or a shame belonging to no one, knocking against everything in its path. His curses were an incantation against too much humility, and the prayers pleaded with the Virgin to make the mosquitoes go away. Then the earth revved and thrummed. He jumped back into the ditch. He lay down flat with the lupins trembling over him. The sirens were loud, even at a distance, baritone whoops that scaled up to near metallic bleats. The hoop of hollow, tin-bright noise overlapping and the torrent of squeal echoed off the hills. Slaney counted five cars. There were five of them. Red and blue bands of light sliced through the lupin stalks and the heads of the flowers tipped and swung in the backdraft as the cars roared past. The siren of each car was so shrill that it pierced the bones in his skull and a tiny hammer in his ear banged out a message of calibrated terror. And the rocks his cheeks rested on in the ditch were full of vibration, and then the sirens, one at a time, receded, and the echoes dissipated, and the silence followed. So, one of the themes that came up in this novel as I wrote it was the idea of innocence and experience. So these were like really young guys setting out to do this thing, but it was at that moment when we all became aware of ourselves with this new surveillance. I, I sort of saw it as a kind of mythic story that was almost like Adam and Eve. Because, you know, when Adam and Eve were cast down from heaven, they found themselves naked and recognized that they were naked and knew they were naked. And I think that that's kind of what happened to us when this new surveillance technology was developed. We, we, we realized we were being watched. We, so it was kind of like a nakedness. I also wanted to write about, one of the funnest parts of writing this novel was trying to create the 70s. And I wanted to write about um, encyclopedias. 
because I remember the moment when my family got an encyclopedia and they were, it was called the books of knowledge. And you know, they fit on a, a, a shelf that was this wide. And I think people kind of believed without ever you know, questioning it too much that all of knowledge was in those books and they you know, fit, fit on a shelf like that. So I wanted to write about uh, um, a moment when, when Slaney comes home from, he's been, he's 12 years old, he's been out playing baseball and he's lied. He says, he tells everyone that he has reached the base and he hasn't, and he's caught out in that. And I was interested in, in the idea of truth and the idea of experience and the idea of innocence and innocence lost. So this, this section that I'm gonna read for you is called Truth and Knowledge. How's everybody doing? And you can hear me okay? All right. Slaney had walked in on his parents in the gloom of the living room at the end of the day. Cabbage boiling in the kitchen, salt beef, potatoes. He was 12 years old, and there were his parents with an encyclopedia salesman. After school, after a game of baseball in the park, after he'd lied about being safe. He said he had touched the base, and then he allowed himself to believe it. He made it up, or remade it. I touched the base. My foot was on the base. I was safe. Safe, he called out. He imagined his foot, and then the smack of the ball. He reconfigured it, changed the order between those events and he had kicked up a cloud of dust sliding in. There was an argument, a bitter fight, which he waited out. Hearn had taken his side, is what happened. I saw it, Hearn said, striding across the field, his body bolt straight, stiff with the injustice. Hearn already a foot taller than everybody. I saw it. Hearn turning to take in all the kids on the field. There were boys and girls. The interminable, sluggish game mattered very much. The pock of the ball hitting the bat and the brief moment when it crossed the sun and was invisible and came back, black at first, visible again on its descent, and the slap in the glove, the yelling. Everything mattered so very much. You all saw it, Hearn said. Slaney touched the base. What happened, Slaney supposed, was that Hearn had convinced him. It was not so much that Slaney was lying, but that he'd succumbed to Hearn's version of events. He believed it. Hearn with spit flying, you all saw it. They had a piece of cardboard for the third base, and his father and mother when he got home, and the salesman who had on a too small jacket. A smarmy jacket with a red tie with slanted silver stripes. The tie should have tipped his parents off, but the guy was mentioning the merits of an education. The jacket was constraining. The fabric torqued at his shoulders, his socks on the car carpet, and his eyes. They had forgotten his parents to turn on the lights in the living room and the man's pale eyes lit up the gloom. His toes in the navy socks were scrunched. He might have pounced on Slaney's father and torn out some organ with his bare hands. He looked ready to eat them, but the jacket was holding him back. The jacket had him by the arms and he couldn't move. Where was everybody else on that afternoon? Slaney was pretty sure his sisters had been in their rooms, the ones still living at home, getting dressed for an evening downtown. Or they were in the kitchen, cooking supper. But the house was weirdly quiet. They hardly ever used the living room. They were like two children themselves, his parents, facing a scolding. They wore funny looks. They were earnest and smarting. They looked as if they'd been told to be quiet. Whatever they'd been told, Slaney was pretty sure it was new to them. 
Here's my youngest son, his father said. Come in, David, and meet Mr. Corrigan. Slaney had been the subject of talk. The current of talk swished through, encircling. There was something bigger than usual in the room. His parents were appraising him. They were trying to decide if it could be true. They had been told something depended on him, perhaps everything. He would be the beneficiary of the encyclopedias. He would make things better. He was going to have a chance his brothers and sisters had missed out on just because they'd arrived before him. Good afternoon, Mr. Corrigan said. He stood up and put out his hand. Slaney had never been made to shake a man's hand before. It was a right, he saw now, and his parents had sprung it on him. We've been talking about your future, Mr. Corrigan said. It seemed that Mr. Corrigan had made his parents a promise of some kind. Whatever he was offering, it seemed to be something they couldn't afford and they couldn't go on without. The books of knowledge. The salesman had unwedged a volume from the carton at his feet and let it fall open to a section of plastic overlays, the skeleton, the arteries, the organs, letting each clear plastic page float down one after the other to build a man from the inside out. The last page fell over the blood and guts, a quiet covering of beige skin. The man in the illustration was bald, his chin set, his head in profile, his arms held out on both sides. Hearn holding out his arms to everyone in the baseball field, a natural orator, commanding, we all saw it, didn't we? I saw it, and you saw it. Jennifer Baker sauntered over to Slaney. The game was breaking up. The heat was too much and the tension. There wasn't a cloud, her hips, the terry cloth halter top. You can trust me, Jennifer said. She was close enough to his face that he could smell the candy she was sucking. He could hear it clicking in her teeth when she moved it from one cheek to the other. A green barrel candy. Everything collapsed. The lie collapsed. Her face had a sheen of moisture and a flush from the sun or exertion. Her dark, sweaty hair, and she was very close to him. He could feel her breath on his cheek. And how conspiratorial. How exclusive their discussion was. The attention was a kind of ravishment. He saw her coming across the field, and then she was no, so near her eyes. So close to him and the word trust. You can trust me. Had he believed it? Had she whispered? He thought she had. The encyclopedia guy snapped the outstretched book closed. They would have to pay for the books of knowledge. You can tell me, Jennifer said. I won't tell them. Just between us. So, did you make the base or not? His mother stirred in the chair, the sound of her nylons, a shushing, as she shifted in the chair and it creaked. No. You didn't? No, I didn't make the base. Bill tagged you first? Bill tagged me first. Before you got to the base. Between us, okay? I'm just curious. He tagged you before you got to the base? Yes. Slaney's mother wanted the books of knowledge. His father flipped the light, a lamp on the side table. The guy's tie, the silver stripes of it, some kind of metallic fabric leapt up. He cheated, screamed Jennifer Baker. Maybe he fell in love with her then, the vehemence, the truth. He had been found out. What a relief. The lie fell away. Everybody stopped in the field and turned to look. He cheated. He admitted it. He just admitted it. He told me so himself. Y'all, y'all still there? <laughs> um, and um, 
what I'd like to do is just read a little bit. Everybody, everybody's comfortable and, and you can hear? Um, so I'm going to read a section now. So Jennifer in that piece, um, she grows up and they do fall in love. They meet again when they're, when they're uh, you know, older and she's had a baby and, and she's a single mother and, and he's madly, madly in love with her. But when he goes off on that first drug trip, he lies to her and tells her that he's going to Alberta to work and that he'll get a house for them, for her and her daughter and that he will bring them up uh, up to you know and he'll he'll take care of them and he doesn't tell them he doesn't tell her that he's that he's gone on this drug trip and then when he breaks out of prison the second time he discovers that she has married someone else and she, and she does it you know just before he he breaks out of prison she knows he's coming and he marries she marries someone else and one of the things that I was very interested in with this book was the idea of freedom. And so when Slaney hits the, the ocean and he's, you know, riding through all that glittering ocean and water and sunshine and heading down to Columbia and, and the thrill of being free like that, he, he's wondering for himself and asking himself, what is freedom? And as I wrote the book, I was also asking myself, what would my own life look like if I was totally free? Like, would it be very different than it is now? What, what is each of our, what does freedom mean to each of us was, was what I was interested in. And along the way, Slaney meets all these people, all these different characters, and they are all trapped in their lives in some way. So there's a, there's a woman that he has a tumultuous one night stand with, and she is actually taking care of her grandfather. And she'd like to go to the big city and she'd like to be, you know, a city girl, but she's staying um, where she is basically until her grandfather dies and knows that she will be taking care of him her whole life. And he also meets another young woman who is, is getting married and she's, she's clearly very pregnant and, and she's getting married because she needs a father for her baby. And so I began to wonder, is, is freedom, does freedom mean freedom from responsibility or, or can we find freedom in responsibility? And of course, Slaney thinks he's free, but he's being watched the whole time and he discovers that rather than being free, He's really been on what he calls a very long leash. And so philosophically, I was interested in that question. Was he free when he thought he was free? You know, do we own our freedom because we feel free? Or can it be that we're not free at all? And, and is our, are our entrapments sometimes invisible to us? So at this moment, what happens, he's, he's heading across Canada and he's decided that uh, he's going to stop in and see his girlfriend who's just got married and try to convince her to wait for him because he's, he's madly in love with her and he knows she's in love with him too. So he, he arrives at her door. Oh, and also it's, it's important to remember that it is, it's a very big risk for him. She's in Ottawa. It's off, it's off his course. He's, he's, he shouldn't be stopping there and he knows very well that the police are probably watching the apartment. And it's the same girl who called him on the basketball field. Baseball field, I mean. Slaney caught her hand just before it struck his face. That was in the f hall when she opened the front door. Jennifer led him into the apartment because of the neighbors. I don't need them mentioning this all up and down the whole building, she said. There were two children having a tea party in the living room with her daughter, Crystal. They were trying to get a new doll out of a cardboard box. Slaney and Jennifer stood in the middle of the room because sitting down didn't seem like the right thing to do. She had her hand pressed to the side of her face. She was looking at the floor and she was rigid as stone. He told her he wanted to give her things to build a life for her. Don't you pin this on me, she said. Don't you dare. He told her he was sorry. Did you get my letters, he said. Yes, I got them. And you didn't answer. 
Social services came by, she said. They had questions, David, about was I a fit mother with a drug smuggler hanging around. They interviewed Crystal without my permission, took her down to the department for an afternoon. Imagine what that was like. She said she could have lost Crystal to foster care. Had he thought about that? Then she told him she wanted him to leave. We could have been a family, she said. He asked her to forgive him. Are you kidding me, she said. Why did you come here? I'm married now, David. I have a husband. That means something. Not a guy who's going to take off on me. Not a guy who would abandon. A man, David. A good man who is honest with me. Do you love him? Yes. Do you love him? Yes. Do you love him? Yes. Do you, Jennifer? Do you love him? I don't love him, no. We are meant to be together, Jennifer, Slaney said. You know it. She spoke slowly then, almost stuttering, a quiet, deliberate tone that didn't belong to her. If you walk away from this, David, I will pack a bag. We can leave. I mean it. Tell me you'll walk away from this racket and I'll go with you right now. No looking back. Crystal and I will take a few things and get the hell out of here. If you will walk away, do you hear me? Say the word. David, just say the word. We'll come with you right now. Start a new life together. He took her hand away from her face and led her down the hall away from the children. He tried a door, but it was the bedroom and he tried another and it was the bathroom and the last room was the laundry room and he took her in there and shut the door and lifted her up onto the washer which was going and they were on each other and he was inside her and the washer was rattling and rocking and it was not sexy it was fast and they were both crying right through it and it changed him the way no other sex had ever changed him and she said don't get caught that's all. She was smoothing his hair out of his eyes. Don't get caught, she whispered. And then she was tugging up her jeans and pulling her po ponytail tight with a vicious tug. And she was crying a little and wiping her eyes. And he said he wouldn't get caught again. And he was coming back for her. He said he didn't care about her husband. He only cared about her and Crystal. And he was coming back. She said, how do I put this, David? I really loved you, I did, but I don't want to see you again. And he saw that she meant it. Thank you. So I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has some. Ye yes? How you decide how you decide what you're going to read how you decide what you're going to read at a launch at a launch at a launch a you're launching this book how do you decide the first thing you're going to read you're opening it out to the air well uh, it's it's a very difficult thing to do actually and I spend a long time you know going through the book over and over again and often I'll go oh my god there's nothing good in this book that I can possibly read um, but what I want is something that's a scene, and I, I want it to somehow show something of the characters, and I want it to be visual. I want it, I want it to be full of images, and I want it to have dialogue, and I want it to be um, something that captures something of the book, and is a, a hint and a taste of what's to come. Thank you. Luigi. Did you manage to find an answer to your question about what is freedom? Did I find an answer to the question, what is freedom? Boy, put me on the spot. <laughs> um, well, freedom for me uh, is writing I, uh, and reading. I, I, I feel like there's just such an intense, um, not escape, because it is an escape. It, it requires a trend, tremendous amount of energy. Um, not just writing, but reading too. You know, when you're reading, you're you're 
you're making the story come alive. And I think it's that working of the Im imagination that I kind of call a vestigial organ. You know, when we wake that thing up and get the juices pumping of, that, of the imagination, that is where the intense pleasure of reading things comes from. And, and that is a kind of freedom for me because um, because I recognize possibility in it. I can see what's possible. Uh, so, I, um, you know, also having a family and, and friends and being able to love them and be with them, that, that's freedom too. Uh, and a lot of that sometimes looks like responsibility. And I, I'm not sure for me that the two are inextricable. Thank you. Um. So you said that the book was based on a lot of myths and stories kind of around your home area. And I was just kind of wondering, do you find that, you know, in a lot of ways, truth is stranger than fiction. Do you find that you find little elements in your story that you're basing it on people you know or stories you heard and that the story kind of grows from there? Or do you feel like it's more myth and imagination that kind of fuels where you go with the story? Well, um is, is, so is truth stranger than fiction? And I'm, I'm basing uh, this novel on, on you know, a bunch of true stories. I went to the uh, library, uh, the Center for Newfoundland Studies in Newfoundland, and I took down a big file, and it was full of newspaper clippings. And as I turned the pages, you know, there were these big pages with the newspaper clippings uh, taped on them. The, head, the headlines were so gripping as the dates went by that like my heart was racing and I, I couldn't sort of believe my luck. And in fact, one headline said, a drug caper takes on James Bond proportions. And um, so, and there was a revelation with every story in the newspaper. And so very soon I stopped reading them. And I, I started just reading the headlines, and then I just closed the file because I really wanted it to be a work of fiction. And what was most exciting for me about it, about turning those you know, true stories into fiction, was the development of character. And the characters in this book really are, you know, they're, they're figments of my imagination. And I, I kind of got to know them as I wrote, and I kind of fell in love with my main character, and was disappointed to find out he wasn't real when I finished writing. And he is kind of real, I guess. Um, so yes, I think truth is stranger than fiction, um, but, but the pleasure is really getting at characters. And you know, I, um, with this book, my previous book was a book called February that was about the sinking of the Ocean Ranger. And it was about a 54-year-old woman who is uh, suffering from the grief of losing her husband. And the book was really, like this woman, Helen, has a whole big full life. And um, you know, she's raising kids, she has a job, she's out there in the world, she has a good relationship with her sister, she's beginning to fall in love, she's getting renovations done on her house. But the most of the novel, the meat of the novel, was about what was going on inside her. And it was her, her thoughts. And I was asked to write a play about February. So the very first thing I realized was you can't have people standing around stage thinking. They have to talk. And there was almost no dialogue in the novel. And so I decided with this novel, Caught, I would do everything exactly opposite to what I had done in February. I wanted, I wanted to really try muscles that I hadn't tried before in fiction. So instead of a, you know, middle-aged uh, woman, I had a 24-year-old drug-smuggling Peter Pan-type boy. And I decided I want him, wanted him to come alive through dialogue. And I wanted, to, I wanted the reader to see him acting and to hear him speaking. And you know that thing where you, you maybe have been on a plane for for maybe a, a, a real, like a transatlantic flight, or you've been on a, a bus that's gone all the way across Canada and you're sitting next to the same person and you tell each other everything, like you tell each other the, 
dark secrets that maybe you've never ever even told your, your partner or anyone, maybe even never admitted to yourself, and partly it's because you know you're never gonna see that guy again. You, you have that freedom. And so Slaney is going across the country and he's meeting all these people in this very pressurized state where he's on the run and they kind of know that they know who he is. He either tells them or they've seen him in the paper. And they just have this brief moment together and I realize this is an opportunity to let people talk about the things that matter most to them in the world, like what they believe life is about, what they think is important. Because most dialogue, of course, when we talk to each other, we say things like, pass the salt, or, you know, that, that's kind of the way talk goes. But I realized that this situation in this novel allowed me to have people say things like, you know, I think freedom is, or, you know, ridiculously big, you know, the big themes, and, th and that was a lot of fun. Oh, hi. Well, I love the book, and I love February, but can you talk about David's mother? Because I was haunted by her feelings. Be I'm sorry, because? Uh, David's mother. Yeah. Just, like, knowing how her son, like, what he was going to, like, what happened to him. Well, you know, one of the things I had to learn in writing this novel was a particular kind of suspense, how to write a particular kind of suspense. And in other uh, drafts of the novel, there was even more of, of David Slaney's mother. And, you know, she, her phone had been tapped during the first trip. And I had a whole big scene about her embarrassment when, when the transcripts were read out in court of you know, what she was saying to her closest friends on the phone. And so I had, a, I had a lot of fun writing that character, but she sort of had to be stripped from the novel because it, 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 it slowed the a action of the novel. And Elizabeth Bowen, who's a fantastic Irish writer, has a, an essay called Notes on the Novel. And in it she says, you can, you can only have things in the novel that move the plot forward. So you can describe characters, you can describe sunsets, but, but it has to somehow move the plot forward. And so I had to take out those parts about the mother, even though I, I kind of loved them. But I, I, I think for me, she's a, an accepting and permissive mother, and she's there for her son throughout. And of course, the scene where she wants to, to buy him the encyclopedia is like, I think, I think it's a, something that we all want to give our children. We want to give them, you know, the keys to the universe. And, and I think that's what, what knowledge is, whatever form it comes in. Thank you. I just have a question about your writing process. I wonder, do you figure out the plot beginning to end when you start, or is it hazier and it kind of evolves as you go? Or someplace in between? Uh, no, it's not in between. <laughs> it's totally hazy. If this is the spectrum and hazy's over here, I'm over here. Um, I, I tend to write the, you know, what happens is I get up at 5.30 in the morning, usually, especially in the winter, and I, I write what I, what I see, what I imagine that character is doing. And what's really important to me is to try and get the sensual life of the character. So, so that we see him or her moving and we know what they're tasting and we know what they're smelling. And I think that makes the world of the novel come alive for the reader. But then as they're moving and you know, doing things and, and experiencing things like sunlight or wet lupin leaves, you know, they're coming into being. And, and then I have to I later go ahead and try to put them on, a tra on the trajectory of the story, on the arc of the story. And through that process, things get cut, and I realize, oh, I've got to make a bridging scene, and I write that. But that comes, uh, you know, after I've written tons and tons of, of stuff about how the character lives and feels and thinks. Thank you. Um, you were a visual artist, artist before you started writing and I'm wondering what you did as a visual artist and if you miss that and you think you'll be going back to it. Um, so I went to the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and studied 
um, painting and drawing and sculpture and everything. It was a, it was a great course. You could do uh, conceptual art, you could do intermedia, everything, and art history. And what I learned from that was the idea of of really trying to make something new. You know, like at the same time knowing it's kind of impossible to make something new. Of course people do it, but it was highly unlikely that I was going to, but still trying, like trying to think about the way an image could be new and exciting. All the while I was doing that, I was also writing, and I still paint, and um, and uh, I, there's there's something, a relationship between the marks that we make uh, when we're painting or when we're drawing, and the way language works that's important to me, and I, I I'm constantly thinking about the relation between those two things. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, Monica. What's next? What's next? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm working on a, a young adult novel, and it's, it's, young, it's a young adult novel in that the character is, is 16 years old, so she's younger. But that's the only way right now that I'm in adhering to any kind of uh, rules about, if there are any, about writing, you know, young fiction for young people. So really, I don't even know if I would call it young adult fiction, but it's, a, it's in the first person. And that, I've never done that before. And, you know, when you're writing in the first person, it's like a voice telling you a story. But there are all kinds of things that you can't have access to that you do have in the third person. Because when you're writing in the third person, then you can describe, you know, what all kinds of different people think or feel or the way things look, for instance. But when we're telling a story, we don't say things like, you know, the light sparkled on the water. So it's a whole new kind of experiment in voice. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to say thank you to you all for being here and for being so attentive and thank you for your questions and thanks for coming out to the library. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Lisa very much for coming to this evening and for the wonderful reading and conversation. Thank you very much again.